Natasha Solomon's book, Mr. Rosenblum's List, is a work that will speak to every Jew. In fact, it's a work of fiction which is at the very heart of a community's diaspora, an evocation of what it is to be a stranger in a strange land, trying to blend into the landscape, to be partly invisible, but also to be a presence within the community. Because by being invisible and commonplace, the refugee becomes a part of the life of the ordinary citizen. I'm talking to Natasha about her book, Mr. Rosenblum's List. No. Natasha, why don't you paint a picture of your book for those people who haven't yet read it? Okay, well, it's, um, it's 1937 and Jack Rosenblum is a refugee from Berlin and he's now living in Britain and he's tired of living in exile. He finally wants a place to call home. So to that end, he's been writing a list of everything that an Englishman is and does. And over the next few years, this list grows to gargantuan encyclopedic proportions. And so by the beginning of the 1950s, he knows that an Englishman must buy his marmalade from Fortnum and Masons. He must buy um, a Jaguar car in racing green. And if he can, he should get his wife to um, wear nice nails and a purple rinse. But the final item on his list, that which he knows no man can possibly be an Englishman without, is that he's got to be a member of a golf club. And when any, every golf club in a 50-mile radius of London turns him down, he does the only logical thing, which is buy 50 acres of land and a spade and moves <laughs> to rural Dorset and starts to dig his own. So tell me about Jack. Um, is he an archetype of the first generation settler? I think he's one example of, I think that sort of Jack and Sadie provide, Sadie his wife, provide sort of two different sort of responses to being a first generation immigrant. Jack, who is desperate to be home, he doesn't want to be a wandering Jew, he wants to belong, he wants to find his roots again. And if that means that sort of in a way it's a terrible metaphor that he's been replanted, he's going to, he's going to root here. And I think that's one, one, one example of it. Um, and yet, yeah, I think Sadie forms the other, somebody who is desperate to remember and desperate sort of to honour the place that she's left behind and is terrified that if she assimilates too far, she will forget and it will be a kind of betrayal. I, I have to say, you write with an astounding insight into the minds and processes of first generation middle aged migrants. What research, what sort of research did you have to do in order to encompass the enormity of uh, these characters that you've? you've written into your book? Um, I think it's sort of twofold. Um, the first part was, yes, I read a lot of memoirs, spent a lot of time in the British Library. But the other part was just more organic, was that I grew up with my um, grandfather and all his friends. And just as a little girl, I literally used to sit at his feet whilst they sort of tell stories over coffee. Um, always really bad coffee, I don't know why. Eating luncheon sausage and playing bridge and reminiscing. And it was about sort of that voice and those stories. And so in that part, I, sort of, I felt it was part of me. I didn't sort of need to remember. And a lot of the names are sort of, again, paying tribute to his old friends. So what's next for Natasha Solomons? What are you working on now? Well, at the moment, I'm working on the screenplay. Um, for Mr. Rosenblum's list with my husband, who's um, a screenwriter, and I am also um, working on my second novel. Lovely. <laughs> Natasha Solomons, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>